The next thing we're going to review are various signaling mechanisms. It's a good opportunity to bridge the biochemistry that you've learned with the pharmacology. We think about the different types of receptors and those signaling pathways. So we start with intracellular receptors, including receptors for steroids. So steroids can diffuse across the, the cell membrane. They can bind to their intracellular receptor. That drug receptor complex goes to the nucleus and stimulates gene expression. So when you think about steroids binding to intracellular receptors, this is a gene expression pathway. What I would have you think about is how rapid of a response do you get to steroids? If steroids involve changes in gene expression, those responses are going to be slower to occur. In fact, let's make sure that we highlight that part of this text. The response to steroids, slow in onset, but long in duration. You see, once you form new proteins with the steroids, they tend to have a long-lasting effect. We have membrane receptors that are directly coupled to ion channels. If the receptor is directly coupled to an ion channel, you have to imagine this is a very rapid responding system, certainly as compared to the steroids, which involve changes in gene expression. Here, when the drug binds to its receptor, you're going to see changes in ion channels. For example, a sodium channel is going to open up and sodium is going to rush into cells. This action occurs completely independent of second messengers. Some examples of ion channel coupled receptors, nicotinic receptors. When acetylcholine stimulates a nicotinic receptor, you're going to see the opening of a sodium and potassium channel, where sodium goes into the cell and potassium is going to exit the cell. Another example would be GABA-A receptors. When you stimulate those GABA-A receptors, they're directly coupled to chloride channels, and a number of drugs can modulate that activity. We have receptors that are linked via coupling proteins to intracellular receptors. What we're basically talking about here are G proteins. You've learned a lot about G proteins. The challenge for us right now is to make sure that you can take what you know about G proteins, couple those directly to certain receptors, and then couple that with the drugs that either stimulate or block those receptors. There are three main types of G proteins that we discuss. On this slide, you see GS and GI. Remember that these types of G proteins are opposite of each other. They both work through adenylyl cyclase, but GS, of course, are stimulatory G proteins. They're going to activate adenylyl cyclase to increase cyclic AMP production. It's actually similar to the action of the toxin from Vibrio cholera. Cholera toxin is going to increase cyclic AMP levels. What you have to do with when you relate G proteins to the pharmacology is you have to tie the G protein to its receptor. There are a lot of receptors that are going to use GS pathways, but betas are really the most important for us to focus on right now. So the rule is all betas are GS. That would be beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3 receptors all work through GS proteins. GI, on the other hand, inhibitory G proteins are going to inhibit adenylyl cyclase, they're going to decrease cyclic AMP. Once again, exactly the opposite of GS. When I see that decrease in cyclic AMP through GI coupled pathways, I'm going to have inhibitory effects on cells. Importantly, receptors that you have to know that are GI coupled, alpha-2, muscarinic M2, and dopamine D2. The third type of G protein is the GQ pathway. GQ is totally different from GS and GI because it doesn't involve adenylyl cyclase or cyclic AMP. GQ is the pathway that's going to activate phospholipase C. Phospholipase C is an enzyme that's going to cleave membrane phospholipids, releasing the second messengers IP3 and diacylglycerol. IP3, of course, releases calcium from the SR, whereas DAG activates protein kinase C. Receptors that you have to match up with GQ would include the muscarinic M1 and M3 receptors and alpha-1 receptors. Here's a cartoon that diagrams exactly how phospholipase C is going to work on this molecule. In fact, if you ask yourself, what have I drawn here? What is this cartoon actually representing? 
that's representing phosphatidyl inositol. You see the glycerol backbone. You see the two fatty acids. You see the polar head group there with inositol attached to it. Well, phospholipase C is going to cleave between the phosphate and the glycerol backbone. That's going to release inositol phosphate, which becomes IP3. IP3 then goes and releases calcium from the SR. What's left is glycerol with two fatty acids. We call that diacyl glycerol. In fact, it's not a bad opportunity for you to review the different types of phospholipases here. In fact, if I ask you, what is the phospholipase that cleaves off the first fatty acid here at the top of the diagram? That would be phospholipase A1. What's the name of the phospholipase that cleaves off the second fatty acid? Well, that's phospholipase A2. In fact, what fatty acid is normally found off of that second carbon? Well, phospholipase A2 releases arachidonic acid. That's part of the arachidonic acid cascade. So many times you find arachidonic acid in that location. We see where phospholipase C works. On the other side of the phosphate, between the phosphate and inositol, that's actually where phospholipase D works. I don't know about you, but I've always had this question in my mind. If we have phospholipase A1, A2, C, and D, what's the question, folks? Where's the B? Well, of course, biochemists name the enzyme. Biochemists are going to reserve the B for biochemistry. So there's no B. There's just A1 and A2. Then there's C and D. This diagram shows us the different types of G proteins. It also gives us an opportunity to look at their signaling pathways in a little bit more detail. So starting on the left, we see the molecule adenylyl cyclase. If I'm talking about a GS-coupled receptor, that receptor, when I activate adenylyl cyclase to produce cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP is going to then activate protein kinase A. It's important to remember the kinase in these pathways. And of course, the easy way to remember, it's A for the kinase, it's cyclic AMP, and A is also for adenylyl. GI, on the other hand, GI are inhibitory G proteins that decrease the activity of adenylyl cyclase. Cyclic AMP levels go down. You inhibit the activation of protein kinase A. On the right, we see the GQ coupled pathways, which involve phospholipase C. You see the cleaving of membrane lipids producing IP3, which releases calcium from the SR, and diacylglycerol, which activates protein kinase C. Protein kinase C goes with phospholipase C. When we think about the different types of receptors that are coupled to G proteins, rule number one, all betas are GS. Rule number two, if you take the three receptors that we've discussed, M2, alpha 2, and D2, you can remember the MAD2s. They're all inhibitory G protein coupled. Rule number three says most of my sub 1s and muscarinic M3s are GQ. Let's look at some examples of the sub 1s. Obviously, alpha 1, M1. The angiotensin 2 receptor is called AT1. It's always a little confusing. AT1 is an abbreviation for the angiotensin 2 type 1 receptor. And that, of course, is GQ coupled. The vasopressin V1 receptor, that's GQ. And the histamine H1 receptor, that's also GQ. So most sub 1s and M3s are GQ. Then there are a few that I call oddballs. There are receptors that don't fit into this pattern. Notice D1, histamine H2, and the vasopressin V2 receptor. Those are actually all GS coupled. So when you go back and summarize GS, it's all betas, but then it's D1, H2, and V2. Cyclic GMP and nitric oxide, very important pathways because cyclic GMP is a second messenger in vascular smooth muscle. In fact, later on, when we're going through our cardiovascular drugs, we're going to look at exactly how cyclic GMP can relax smooth muscle. I've got a great diagram coming up later on in the lectures. But for now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you the end of the story. I don't know if you've ever done that. Do you ever buy a book 
and you sometimes you read the last chapter of the book just so you know how it ends to see if you really want to read the whole thing. I'm going to tell you the end of the story, and then later on I'm going to tell you the entire story about cyclic GMP and nitric oxide. So how does nitric oxide relax smooth muscle? It ends up causing dephosphorylation of myosin light chains. That's the final step, dephosphorylation of myosin light chains. We'll tell the rest of the story later on. You know, we have a couple of endogenous compounds like bradykinin and histamine. Bradykinin and histamine are both vasodilators, and at least part of their vasodilating action is mediated through nitric oxide. We have receptors that function as enzymes or transporters. If you look at the long list of enzymes and transporters on this slide, you know, many of those are important. Many of those show up on your step one exam. The way that we're going to deal with those is one at a time. As we go through the remainder of the lectures, we're going to go through each of those and talk about why that's important for your test. We have receptors that function as transmembrane enzymes. Importantly, this is how insulin signals and a couple of growth factors, epidermal growth factor and platelet-derived growth factor. These pathways for insulin and these two growth factors involve tyrosine kinase activity. That's important. Ultimately, the binding of the ligand causes a conformational change that causes these receptors to dimerize. The tyrosine kinase domains become activated, and then we're going to phosphorylate tissue-specific substrate proteins. In the margin is a clinical correlate about a couple of tyrosine kinase inhibitors. This pathway has become a very popular target for a number of drugs. We've got the drug imatinib, a very specific tyrosine kinase inhibitor, whereas sorafenib is a nonspecific tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Both of these drugs will be discussed later on in our lectures. The final receptors that we're going to look at are receptors for cytokines. You should think about things like erythropoietin, somatotropin, interferons. This is what we call the JAK-STAT pathway. JAK stands for Janus Activated Kinase. In fact, this is what I call the insulin-like part of this pathway because JAK is a type of tyrosine kinase. The difference between this pathway, however, and insulin is that the tyrosine kinase for the insulin receptor is intrinsic. It's built into the receptor itself, whereas JAK is a distinct molecule. JAK is a separate molecule from the receptor for the cytokine. JAKs are going to phosphorylate STATs. STATs are signal transducers and activators of transcription. STATs are very steroid-like because they mediate the gene expression part of this receptor. So if I were to put those two pieces together, how would you describe a cytokine receptor? It's like an insulin receptor has combined with a steroid receptor. I've got a tyrosine kinase activity with gene expression. JAK is a separate molecule, STAT is a separate molecule, and both are distinct from the receptor.